The reading this morning is from a spoken word poet named Sonia Rene, and um, it is a, a poem not really to be fully understood, but more to be experienced. And so the, the images come at you, and, and I've found that the best way to kind of, to kind of access this, this spoken, spoken word poem is just to allow the, the images to wash over you, and if you, if you get stuck on one, just let it go, and, and it'll be on to the next one as soon as possible. It's called, The Body is Not an Apology. The body is not an apology. Let it not be forget-me-not fixed to mattress when night threatens to leave the room empty as the belly of a crow. The body is not an apology. Present it not as disassembled rifle when he has yet to prove himself more than common intruder. The body is not an apology. Let it not be common as oil, ash, or toilet. Let it not be small as gravel, stain, or teeth. Let it not be mountain when it is sand. Let it not be ocean when it is grass. Let it not be shaken, flattened, raised in contrition. The body is not an apology. Do not give it as confession, communion. Do not ask for it to be pardoned as criminal. The body is not a crime, is not a gun. The body is not a spill to be contained. It is not a lost set of keys, a wrong number dialed. It is not the orange burst of blood to shame white dresses. The body is not an apology. It is not the unintended granules of bone beneath wheel. The body is not kill. It is not unkempt car. It is not a forgotten appointment. Do not speak it vulgar. The body is not soiled. It is not filth to be forgiven. The body is not an apology. It is not a father's backhand. It is not mother's dinner, late again, wrecked jaw howl. It is not the drunken sorcery of contorting steel around a tree. It is not calamity. The body is not a math test. The body is not a wrong answer. The body is not a failed class. You are not failing. The body is not a cavity. It is not a hole to be filled, to be yanked out. It is not a broken thing to be mended, to be tossed. The body is not a prison. It is not a sentence to be served. It is not pavement. It is not prayer. The body is not an apology. Do not give the body as gift, only receive it as such. The body is not to be prayed for, it is to be prayed to. So for ever, the evermore tortile tenth grade knows hallelujah. For the shower song throat that crackles like the grandfather's Victrola, hallelujah. For the spine that never healed, for the lambent heart that didn't either, hallelujah. For the sloping pulp of back, hip, belly, hosanna. For the errant hairs that rove the face like a pack of displaced wolves, Hosanna. For the parts we have endeavored to excise, blessed be even the cancer, the palsy, the womb that opens like a trapdoor. Praise the body in its blackjack magic, even in this. For the razor wire mouth, for the sweet God ribbon within it, praise for the mistake that never was, praise for the bend, twist, fall, and rise again fall and rise again, for the raising like an obstinate Christ, for the salvation of a body that bends like a baptismal bowl, for those who will worship at the lip of this sanctuary. Praise the body, for the body is not an apology. The body is deity. The body is God. The body is God, the only righteous love that will never need to say sorry. Two years ago, just a couple weeks after moving to North Carolina, just a couple weeks before starting here at Community Church, I began a journey that I believe has changed my life, a journey that's transformed my life, and I don't think it's too melodramatic melodramatic to say a journey that has saved my life. Those are spiritual terms, change, transformation, salvation. And this journey I'm describing to you began when I joined a gym. How's that for blending the worldly with the spiritual? And so what I'd like to do in the first part of this sermon, the first part of it, is to tell you a bit of a personal story, 
But before I share my personal story, I want to give you some information that may help you to contextualize the story I'm about to tell you. Back in 2007, down the road in Durham, the Duke Divinity School launched a program called the Clergy Health Initiative. The initiative, supported by a multi-million dollar investment from the Duke Endowment, embarked on a 10-year longitudinal study of the health of United Methodist ministers here in North Carolina, and then would launch and develop programs designed to improve clergy health. So one of the first things they did way back in 2007 and 2008 was a health assessment of all United Methodist ministers in the state. And what they found was alarming and shocking and made you know, national news, made the New York Times. Even after controlling for factors like age, gender, socioeconomic status, and quality of health insurance, the Clergy Health Initiative found that Methodist ministers had significantly higher rates of obesity, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, and asthma than their non-ordained peers. Ministers, they also found, had higher rates of depression and were at a higher risk of having a stroke as well. For a long time, people had sort of assumed that, that ministers tend to live longer lives. We're, we're not exactly the type of people who engage in risky behaviors. But the Duke study actually showed and concluded that being a, a minister could be hazardous to your health, like smoking or eating fast food, or abusing drugs. I'm going to say a little bit more about that health initiative later, but what it revealed may help you to better understand my own story. See, when I arrived here in North Carolina, I was not in very good shape. I had served for over a decade in the Midwest, and during that ministry, I did not take as good of care of myself as I should have and as I could have although being a younger minister probably masked that a bit, masked the abuse a bit. I now refer to that period, my, my, a period in the Midwest, I call it my decade on the couch. And what happened during the course of my first ministry is that I threw myself passionately, heart and soul, all of it, into the work of ministry. I told myself I, I didn't really have time to work out. There was too much work to do. I didn't have time to be physically active. There was, there was always something to do for the church. And the stress of the job resulted in some pretty bad habits of eating and sleeping. So the trajectory that I was on through my first decade of ministry was one that would bear out and prove the findings of the Duke Clergy Health Study had they decided to study Unitarian Universalists as well. In fact, my lifestyle back then was so sedentary that I had you know, weak muscles and I began to develop back problems. My posture was awful and I was 28 the first time I threw my back out. So there I was, 28, with a prescription for oxycodone for back pain. Not a good place to be. I'd break a sweat carrying groceries in from the car. I'd get winded pushing my daughter in her stroller. And if I continued on that path that I was on, I came to face, I would be probably setting myself up for a premature death. And this was not what I wanted. I had a two-year-old. And so when I moved here to Chapel Hill a little over two years ago, I told myself that I was going to turn over a new leaf. And so a couple weeks before I started here, I walked in the door of CrossFit Chapel Hill. It's located over at University Mall, or I guess University Place, as it's called now. CrossFit. Anybody ever heard of it? Anybody ever heard of it? The theory, the theory behind it is that you achieve improved fitness by, they put it in the words, performing constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. Um, well, the workouts are a blend of calisthenics, weightlifting, and gymnastics and it has a reputation for being intense, for being kind of hardcore. And there's some truth to this to an extent. One of the people I work out with um, formerly played in the NFL. Um, another who I worked out side by side with um, is a star student, was a star student athlete at UNC who now plays soccer professionally in Europe. Um, one member of the gym, the oldest member, is a professor at UNC who's in his 60s. 
Um, but I am by far on the older side of the gym's clientele there. At the same time, the theory goes that everything that they do is scalable to one's ability level, that every exercise can be appropriately adapted to be challenging to you at your ability. And so on one side of me, there might be someone doing pull-ups with a 50-pound weight chained around their waist. And on the other side of me, there might be someone doing uh, pull-ups with a really thick elastic band helping them to get their chin over the bar. And even further down, there may be someone who doesn't feel comfortable on the bar, um, but kind of just leans back holding a bar and pulls up. Scalable. So I walked through the door of CrossFit Chapel Hill two years ago, did the workout, which they heavily modified for me, Woke up the next morning with every muscle in my body in a state of anger and protest, and then went back and back again, and I kept going back through soreness and frustration and tears, through um, going back every single week, four times a week, pretty much every week for the last two years. This has changed me, transformed me, saved me. I feel good, I feel strong, I feel energized. It's not like I've become some elite athlete on any given day at the gym, there's at least uh, one woman who outlifts me. And so I've that's kept learned to keep, my, to keep my ego in check. In fact, on, on Friday, I got out bench pressed um, by, uh, by a, a young woman who's a UNC student who lifted bench press 10 more pounds than I did. So some ego stuff there. But I'm also proud of the progress that I've made. When I showed up two years ago, I wasn't able to do a pull-up and a week ago, during the workout, I did 100 pull-ups, which is, um, I never thought I'd be doing that. Um, but more importantly than that, more importantly than that, now I can rearrange an entire room full of furniture for the exploring membership class without breaking a sweat, <laughs> can carry my daughter from one end of the zoo to the other without worrying that I will drop dead. <laughs> but beyond any of this, beyond feeling good or feeling strong or healthy or energetic, beyond feeling proud of how much weight I can lift, and beyond the joy of keeping up with my daughter, there is another change that has taken place, one that I have a harder time describing, and that is the feeling of being more embodied, more aware of, more in touch with, more responsive to, more connected to my own body. Does that make any, does that make any sense at all? That, that feeling of being in touch with one's own body. Now I'd like to leave the personal and, and turn to the theological. And so I ask, what if, what if the body is a source of spiritual wisdom? One of the more interesting findings of the Clergy Health Initiative study at Duke, at least as far as I read the findings, is that it seems to link spiritual health and physical health together. It seems to link the two together. Maybe this shouldn't be surprising, but to a degree it is. I think as a society we have a fantasy of the person who's able to spiritually transcend their physical condition. This includes the examples of, of Jesus and many of the saints who are able to transcend unspeakable torments of the flesh without losing spiritual strength. This includes anyone who suffers the slings and arrows of disease or injury while maintaining a saintly disposition. We seem to love this idea that we can transcend our bodies. But the Duke Clergy Health Initiative kind of calls this into question in a way that's understandable. The results of the initiative connect chronic illness with sort of a diminished effectiveness in the ministry and with spiritual struggles. Can the spirit be actually separated from the body? And where does this idea come from, this, this idea of a dualism between body and spirit? Where does this idea that the spirit is separate from the body come from? The Western intellectual tradition, which encompasses both Greek philosophy and monotheism, encourages ways of thinking that are at times dualistic and hierarchical. 
These intellectual trajectories led to systems of categorization, separation, and even oppression. And they've created the mind-body dualism that's become so dominant in Western religious, philosophical, and even scientific thought. In terms of religion, we're familiar. We're familiar with the ways that conservative theology is hostile to the body. The conservative interpretation of the story of Adam and Eve renders the body as a source of shame and sin. The punishment for disobedience, so we're told, includes an eternity of physical toil, painful childbirth, illness, and mortality. And conservative theology has enforced hierarchies around, along racial lines and gender lines, has regarded gender and sexuality as dualistic, and has led us to regard the body with fear, shame, and disgust. The classic illustration of such a conservative theology to me, um, uh, such a conservative theology of the body occurred um, when John Ashcroft, a very conservatively religious man, became attorney general of the United States, and, and one of his first acts was to order a statue in the Justice Department, a statue of, of a bare-breasted woman holding scales of justice, you know, one of those classic kind of Greek-Roman statues, ordered um, the, the woman to be covered in a garment. The body needs an apology. And I could fill dozens of sermons with examples from conservative theology that cast the body in a negative light. But it's not like liberal social institutions always deal with the body in a positive way either. Liberal communities, it seems to me, do a good thing when we take care to avoid being judgmental, to avoid oppression, to avoid objectification, to avoid exclusion. And all of this is good. Clearly, all of this is good. But I also get the sense sometimes that oppression, judgment, and exclusion are avoided by making, the topic of, by making the topic of the body off limits. Let me see if I can explain that. One of the people I met um, at the CrossFit gym is a professor of linguistics at UNC. And I remember this conversation I had with her. She remarked, when we were hanging out with some people from the gym, she remarked how different this community is than the academic community to which I belong. She said, when I, whenever I talk about the body in an academic community, people look at me strangely and regard me as if I'm violating some kind of social norm. I know just what you mean, I told her. I've served a liberal church for over a dozen years, and oftentimes the body is never spoken of or regarded in our religious discourse. I, I've written and delivered more than 500 sermons, and this is the very first time that I've talked about the body in a sermon. 500 sermons, and this is the first time I've talked about the body. Truth be told, the body is not completely ignored in our church community. We have the Our Whole Lives sexuality education program that teaches our young ones a, an, a form of embodied wisdom. We've had spiritual education for adults classes on Tai Chi and yoga. We have a softball team. They're playing uh, right after church gets out today. And there's a group that takes outdoor trips. And I know for many of us that the experience of nature through hiking and canoeing and kayaking is a spiritual practice, a spiritual practice deeply revered by many of us. But the question I have, the question I have is how we might reconcile, reconcile this profound, transformative, life-saving experience that I've had through doing CrossFit with my own ministry in a church community. Let me be clear that I have no intention to replace the worship service with an hour of calisthenics. You'll never, you'll never walk in and find that. Let me be also be clear that I'm, I'm forever committed to preaching an embodied theology only if it is accessible to everyone. And by that, I mean all ages, all body types, all abilities, all gender expressions. I'm not going to categorize. But I do, at the same time, I do worry that silence about the body, that dualistic thinking that separates the body from the spirit, leads to the kind of health hazards that that Duke Clergy Health Initiative uncovered. 
I do worry that silence about the body is dangerous. This week, um, a member of our church read the sermon topic um, and decided to bring by a, um, a book and an and a, a article and a, a journal entry for me to read. Um, it dealt with a, a trip um, that this person had taken to, um, to Crete, to a Mediterranean island, um, where discovering through sort of going back through history, uh, discovered evidence of kind of a goddess-worshipping culture that predated predated um, monotheism and, and, and Platonism. And she shared this with me because for her, embodied spiritual traditions, feminist spiritual traditions, non-dualistic spiritual traditions are deeply connected with environmental and ecological awareness. That old dualism that separated spirit from body also separated humankind from nature. And those results, those results have been disastrous to our global climate. So an embodied spirituality, an embodied spirituality might reconnect us with our, not only ourselves, but with this planet and all of its beings to which we are connected. And so my challenge to you, my challenge to you is to find a way to be in your body to do something, to do something, especially if you're not right now, do something to take care of the health of your body. To refuse to allow the body to be an apology. And to open yourself to the spiritual wisdom that comes through our embodied self. These aren't easy challenges, but um, they're, they're ones that... Uh, that may be good for all of us. Thank you for listening to my own personal kind of testimonial about what's going on in, in my life a little bit. And uh, thank you for allowing me to, to talk about my gym community, my, my other faith community that I belong to. And uh, thanks for being here. <laughs>